So we are starting a new series this week, and we have called it Most Radical. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, I've been hung up on this word radical for the last year or so, because it strikes me as being the perfect word to sum up a lot of what living by faith should feel like. But it is quite possible that you don't like the word. It may bring up images of that sort of youth speak from the late 80s, early 90s, the sort of speak and words that were slightly out of fashion even when I was growing up. You know, phrases like radical and cool and extreme. (laughs) Knew I shouldn't have done that. But honestly, this series isn't a 40-year uh, year too late attempt for us to appear down with the kids. It is simply a recognition that Jesus, when he walked the earth, when he taught and preached, when he demonstrated God's love, not only in words but through action, was one of the most radical things to ever happen in human history. I reckon even if you don't believe Jesus was God's son, even if you don't believe Jesus rose from the dead, you cannot deny the astonishing and mind-blowing effect Jesus had on the course of history. And perhaps it's that history that presents us with a bit of a problem now, because after 2,000 years of Christianity, it's tempting, and perhaps in general society is the norm, to regard the teachings of Jesus as old-fashioned as out of touch, as irrelevant to the world in which we now live. But I think that is a travesty. It's certainly true that when Jesus walked the earth all those years ago, the things he told his followers and his audiences were totally radical. They challenged the established order. They critiqued society, even the teachings of the Old Testament, that at that point were the way people understood and obeyed God. Jesus taught that faith wasn't something old, rules written in a dusty book. It was something living and breathing and constantly new. And that was radical 2,000 years ago. But perhaps the biggest surprise is that Jesus' teachings are still radical even today. Jesus' teachings still challenge us to live differently, still take a contrary view to the attitudes we often see in the world around us, They still ask us to consider whether our religious traditions are actually helpful and demand that we see everything we encounter in the light of Jesus's love. So over the next three Sundays, we've selected three aspects about Jesus that strike us as the most radical. And to kick us off this morning, I've chosen a passage that perhaps we've heard many times before, but I reckon the more you think about it, the more radical it actually becomes. Okay, so... Why is this radical? Well, first off, let's consider what it meant to those hearing Jesus himself preach this 2,000 years ago. Now, at the time, the way people tended to live their lives owed a lot to what was written in what we now refer to as the Old Testament. They didn't call it that back then. That would have been a pessimistic view, wouldn't it? (laughs) It was simply Scripture, the Testament, And a lot of it was based on even older laws. And Jesus summed some of its teaching up quite nicely. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That was how people tended to view things. If someone did you wrong, you would do something wrong back. It felt a perfectly natural response. And of course, no one was really going to question it, because let's be honest, even today, it feels like a totally natural response. I hope I'm not shocking you all um, by sharing this about myself, but if someone does something wrong to me or takes something from me, I can feel an urge to do something wrong back to them. Take something of theirs. It's like a flash of anger. You may have heard it called the red mist. We can probably all remember times when we or people we know have acted in unedifying, maybe even embarrassing ways when we have felt this urge to retaliate. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. In fact, despite its apparent savageness, you could argue the Old Testament teaching is actually about temperance. I mean, after all, you could fly off the handle and do much worse back to your enemy than they had done to you, then they could escalate it back, and before you know it, there's a snowball effect going on. So the idea of limiting your retaliation 
uh, to being no worse than the original act was probably seen as a virtue. And in fact, even in Jesus' time, the return retaliation was often actually just a sum of money that was seen to be equated to the original wrong. So it's not really quite as harsh as it sounds. But even so, we can see that the idea behind it is that retaliation is acceptable, is natural. But now Jesus is here, being totally radical in what he says. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. No longer is it enough to simply control your retaliation in line with the behavior behavior shown to you. Jesus turns it away from the physical act of retribution or revenge and turns it into a heartfelt matter of how you feel about the person who did you wrong. Don't hate them, love them. Don't hurt them, pray for them. Perhaps it's a recognition that retaliation not only harms others, it brings out the worst in ourselves. Some of the things I am most embarrassed about in my life are things that have been said or done in the heat of arguments in that act of retaliation. This teaching of loving your enemy, to those who would have heard Jesus say it, would have felt totally unnatural. It wasn't what they'd been taught by their religious leaders, and it wasn't what their hearts naturally jumped to in these situations. And I want to suggest that it still feels totally unnatural to us today. When you are on the receiving end of crime or violence or negative control, when you are presented with rudeness or indifference, when you meet someone whose view is totally abhorrent to you, or perhaps even away from ourselves, when we see people behaving appallingly towards others, when we see leaders of nations waging war on innocent civilians, when we see corporate or governmental scandals that treat people as pawns in a game of profit, does your heart, does your soul leap first to loving the perpetrators? to praying for them? Can I be so bold as to presume the answer for all of us is probably no. So for us to think about how we can even begin to do what Jesus teaches, I think we first need to ask, what does Jesus mean by love your enemy? We are, please, seriously not talking about going up to people who've harmed us with a bunch of flowers and a box of milk tray, are we? Well, this is one of those instances where it really helps to go back to the original Greek text of the gospel to find out what word was used for love. Because you see, ancient Greek uh, had different words for different forms of love. For example, eros uh, is about an erotic love. Philia is a kind of sibling love. But the word used here is agape. Agape is more akin to a a parental love, an unselfish love, a willingness for the best in someone type of love. It's not the cold, hard passion of being in love with someone, but it might be closer to the hard slog of putting aside our anger and our bitterness to show goodwill, to set a good example for someone. And this level of detail is really important because... I think we should note that the message from Jesus here isn't actually don't have enemies. Jesus isn't commanding us to bury our heads in the sand and pretend that everything is okay, everyone is okay. I think Jesus very well recognizes that there are people who stand to do us harm. And this agape love of wanting the best for someone doesn't mean we don't challenge people on their behavior. It doesn't mean we don't take steps to limit harm that we can see being done. It's one of the hideous facts of Christianity that these verses where Jesus says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn and offer them your left, have been taken to mean that, for example, victims of 
domestic abuse or control should stay in such relationships. I don't believe any part of Jesus' teaching says that you have to stay in that sort of scenario out of a love for your enemy. Quite apart from anything else, there is precious little agape love in allowing someone to continue being abusive, controlling, or with unchecked anger. If agape love for our enemies is our goal, then we should seek to see healing and peace. Letting harmful situations continue is not healing, it's not peaceful, and it's not showing love for our enemies. Sometimes it is our role to draw a line in the sand and say, no more. But the key is that our actions and our responses and our decisions do not come from a place of anger or retaliation or revenge, but from a place of peace and respect and a desire to see good win out, to see right overcome wrong. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel like that requires a superhuman level of response. So unnatural a response, perhaps, that to obey it, we may need as much help from God as we've ever needed for anything at all. Because regardless of the passage of 2,000 years, the world around us still does not work in the way Jesus espouses. We see heartbreaking wars and conflicts around the world that do not demonstrate this agape love. We see government policies and plans that do not demonstrate this agape love. We see corporations reveling, promoting, profiting from plans and actions that do not demonstrate this agape love. And if you use social media, you're probably familiar with a way of conversing with other human beings that is so far the opposite of this agape love, you may even think it had been deliberately set up to function that way. All of which, to me anyway, begs the question, is this teaching from Jesus actually useful? Apart from trying to do it simply because Jesus told us we should, is it even possible in today's world to live our lives loving our enemies? Should we even try when everything around us simply doesn't bother? Well, I invite you to do a thought experiment. Think of an injustice in the world. Think of a situation where harm has been done, where people have been hurt, where wrongs seemed to overcome right. And then at any point in the process of how these things came to be, try plugging in this teaching of Jesus, this attitude of a keenness to see the best in the other side, a want to see the other party thrive, to treat the other person in the way we would wish to be treated ourselves. How might that have changed the situation? How might it have changed the path of the scenario? I can't think of any situation that wouldn't be immensely improved if Jesus' radical teaching could be followed. The post office scandal that we're learning about, the debate on immigration, the demonization of certain parts of society, wars, conflicts, mistrust, division, from close scenarios with our families and friends, even within our church, to wide international situations. Problems are so often exacerbated by a lack of respect and love for the other side. And decisions that have been made out of fear, retaliation, and a sense of superiority. Now, I'm not saying there's easy answers to many of these things, but I am saying we need to be sure that our thinking our responses, our decisions are coming from the right place within us. I sometimes bristle at the phrase, charity begins at home. I'm sure it was developed from a very well-meaning place, but I've seen it used in a way that infers that actually charity ends at home as well. 
But the radical bit in Jesus' teaching is that we love our enemies, those who are not like us, those who are far away, those who do us wrong. Agape love, where we want to see them become the best person that they could possibly be. We want to see them thrive. We want to see them do right, do well. What a radical world it would be. What a radical change that could make. And it may seem unattainable, but the important thing is for us to hear what Jesus is saying, to make the changes in our lives, because it's our responses, our actions, that we have responsibility for. And you may say, well, I might try to do this, but look at the world. It needs far more important people than me to do this. You might say that. But the truth is, for the people you meet and live with, for the companies that you work for, for the people you work with, you are actually the most important person there could be to demonstrate Jesus' radical love. And we are not in this alone. Jesus promised to be with us all, always, until the end of the age. What a radical God we have who promises to help us be the change that we want to see in the world. We know it won't be easy. We know we will stumble. But let's make a promise today to be a part of that radical love of God in our own lives and in the world around us. I want to finish this morning by reading you the same verses that we heard earlier from Matthew's Gospel. But this time I'm going to read it from the message. It's a version of the Bible that paraphrases the text, allows us to hear the same message but in new ways. And when I was reading this, I thought, this is um, a good sum up. It reads like this. You're familiar with the old written law. Love your friend, and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the supple moves of prayer. For then you are working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm, the rain to nourish, to everyone, regardless, the good and bad, the nice and nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, What I'm saying is, grow up. You are kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously towards others. The way God lives towards you. Far from being an irrelevant rule in a dusty book, Jesus' teaching and actions really are what the world needs to hear today. And if we can follow Jesus' teaching to love our enemies, that really would be most radical. Amen. Amen.